got another exclusive TIFF 2019 interview for you right now. This is for the movie Synchronic. You guys might recognize these two over here who came in for the witching hour to talk about The Endless. Big fan of everything you do. Let's just jump right into it really quick. Uh, Synchronic for everybody out there who does not know what this movie is about. I know it's tough to do this over and over and over, but can you give a quick synopsis? Uh, yeah, it is about two paramedics who've been friends their entire lives, played by Anthony Mackie and Jamie Dornan. And uh, they're in New Orleans, and they stumble across this series of very grisly, seemingly impossible or strange first responder situations. And they're all linked together by a, an over-the-counter designer drug called Synchronic, uh, which has some very bizarre effects. And Allie, actually, do you want to do you want to tell your part of it? Sure. Yeah. My character um, takes the drug, and then she goes missing. Oh, and she is the daughter of, oh, true. Yeah, yes. sorry. of Jamie Dornan, <laughs> one of the paramedics. You also get one of the coolest sequences in the movie, and I'm not going to spoil that, but it is something else. Uh, where did this idea start from? Because obviously the, the high concept is the time travel drug, but there's so much else character-wise going on. So is there any starting point that got you access to the entire thing? I think, you know, there's, there's so many movies that whenever they go back to the past, especially if it's the 1950s or 1960s, it's really romanticized and it has this sort of probably dishonest sheen on it where it was like, yeah, it was probably great for a few people, but like a very small subset of the population. And the further you go back in time, even like if you're watching like a, like a, 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 a Renaissance period piece or something, it's like, yeah, the Renaissance was good for some people, but, but not... Again, small subset of the population. Um, so it was like it was that idea, and looking at other time travel movies, especially something like Back to the Future, where mm -hmm. it's like Back to the Future is an amazing film. It's beloved. You can't, if it's in a room, you have to watch it. But again, uh, you look at Marty McFly. If Marty Mar Marty McFly weren't a white heterosexual male, that story would be very different. He would there, there would be much bigger dangers than like you know his mom trying to hook up with him. Very, very, very true. It does add a really interesting layer to this movie that we haven't really seen before in time travel uh, films. Do you have a time travel Bible somewhere? And does that Bible stay consistent from film to film? Because, I don't know, I, I feel like you guys probably have an obsession with time in some respect. There's definitely a cohesion between the four films. Um, there's, e there's even one line in Synchronic that does tie it to the world of the Endless and Resolution. Oh, it really um, bothers me that I missed that. That's okay. Uh, I mean, are we, sp are we doing a spoiler? I guess we are. We're talking about time wait, wait. travel. Okay. So. We're gonna, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a non-spoiler interview, and then I'm going to come back to that, and we'll do a separate little video that okay. when everyone gets the opportunity to see the movie, we'll cover that. Okay. I would say that, uh, yeah, I would say that the time travel thing is part of a spoiler because it only comes in about an hour into the movie, but it's up to you because it's hard to dodge okay. talking about it. Okay, we're yeah. going to push pause on that for now, but I'm coming back to it in that separate video. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about the casting process on this one? Actually, before we even get there, I feel like the last time we spoke about The Endless, what was that, last, last year, end of the year? Yeah. When did this movie actually get the green light and when did you start shooting it? Uh, we got the green light in June 2018 and it's September 2019. So it was a pretty pretty quick process, yeah. pretty quick to turn around. We started shooting in November 2018. Okay, yeah. so probably right after you came to visit yeah. us. That's, uh, that's quite the turnaround and the accomplishment to premiere at TIFF so soon after. Um, was the assumption that I made earlier correct that you guys had more resources to work with on this one than you ever have before? Yeah, there was a little bit more. Not, not as much as you might think given the level of the cast and everything, but, but, uh, but it was definitely more than we had had in the past, for sure. And what was it like getting this film off the ground compared to your last ones? Did having The Endless in your back pocket make more of a difference than ever? The Endless specifically is what made it happen just because an agent happened to see the last screening of The Endless in a theater because they liked the poster. Um, and uh, that agent is Jamie Dornan's agent. And uh, yeah. so they, they hit us up and, and that got the movie rolling. Um, and that, at that agency, because they're both repped at UTA, and we were able to, to get our Dreamcast, so. Oh, wow, so given that experience, when you, I know we're looking ahead a little too far right now, but given how this one came to be and how you got a green light, does that change the way you're gonna approach your next feature? Like, is there any way you can kind of 
you know, try to recruit someone, like that that person who's kind of like the, the linchpin of getting the green light? Yeah, I mean, we've been trying to approach uh, celebrity talent that would green light a movie since our first movie, Resolution, and it took Resolution, Spring, and The Endless to get to that point where someone out there was like, I really, I'm really, i really gonna push for you guys this time. Um, so we've been trying forever, and hopefully what this means is is that door's a little more open than it was previously. So. I, I don't understand that. It's <laughs> like, maybe after Resolution, you know, the first time around, you want a second one to really prove yourselves, but like, that paired with Spring, it should have just made all of them come a lot faster. <laughs> yeah. uh, and can you tell me a little bit about getting Anthony Mackie into the equation because the chemistry between Jamie Dornan and Anthony Mackie is key. You don't want to pass on someone like that if that opportunity comes to you, but you want to make sure they've got that right vibe going. Yeah, well, honestly, it was just, we, we watched, I mean, who hasn't seen Anthony Mackie movies, but we watched The Hurt Locker and Detroit and Catherine Bigelow stuff um, because that's, a, that's as much darker work, which mm -hmm. this is. And, uh, and that, was, that was why we wanted him, I mean, of course. And uh, he's a, he's a world-class talent. And uh, luckily that door was slightly open because Jamie was into the script and Jamie and Anthony had talked about working together before. And so that, this was their opportunity to do it. So Ali, I want you to make the two of them blush right now. Also because the last we spoke, it was just me, Haley, and the two of you. So I'm curious from the performance perspective, what is it like working with the two of them as actor directors? Can you tell me a little bit about them being co-directors for you? Yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's amazing. Like, they're so trusting of everyone that works for them, which I think is really beautiful and really brave. Um, and they're also just really nice people, and they're really funny. Like, a lot of people were like, how was it, like, filming that last scene? It was really intense. But I feel like we were joking around. Like, I feel like it was really fun. Um, and yeah, like, even though it was, it was fast and, like, we didn't have a lot of time, like, it was, I felt really safe like to be able to express myself and like be in the moment and yeah they're just like really funny like cool people they're really fun to hang out with too so <laughs> i can get that sense um talking about just the time travel and that extra layer that you add to this it makes me think of something that i often think about when it comes to anybody at like people always ask where would you want to go if you could time travel and i always say not back because there's a lot of problems and a lot of luxuries you don't have access to. And the fact that someone verbalized that in this movie kind of validated my standpoint on that. But for all three of you, if you could hop in a time machine and go back, what would you choose and why? Um, I, I, uh, I think for me, it would only just be about going to go hear uh, really good music uh, live. So that would be the only thing. I, I wouldn't want to go see how the world was or anything like that. I wouldn't want to go get health care from 1917. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't really want to go back before I couldn't like pull the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy out of my pocket and just find out any piece of information I want. Um, so yeah, it would just be, be fun little culture things and then immediately get back here. Yeah. The last time I answered this question, it was specifically to go back in time to be present for a certain movie premiere. Really? Which one? Which one? Uh, I, want, I was there when Jurassic Park opened, but I want to revisit that feeling as an adult so many years later. But I also want to be there for when the first Star Wars movie opened up. I that, feel that's you. That's just such that's an incredible cool. game changer. Yeah, and to get a taste literally. of the air at that period when it first hit theaters and just wowed everyone with this innovative thing for the first time, mm. to get a taste of that would be a dream come true. That's cool. How about for you two? I don't know. Maybe I'd like to see the dinosaurs. I feel like if I had the chance to time travel, like, like I would... I'm not afraid of the risks. Like, going back would be really cool. Like, I'm down. Like, I, even, like, after seeing Synchronic, like, I take it. I can't go back to a period of time that didn't have, uh, you know, proper toothbrush, toothpaste, and contact solution. True. Yes. But if you're going for seven minutes. I just realized if... As long as you can get back. Yeah. As long as I could breathe the atmosphere and it's seven minutes and I know that I'm gonna go see a dinosaur, I would love. To, I, I'm sorry about your Jurassic Park. I don't mean to co-opt it, but I would love no, to see it for do. real. That's a really yeah. cool idea. The more Jurassic Park love I can spread in my life, the better. Yeah. <laughs> what you got? Uh, I wouldn't do it. I just wouldn't do it. Also, I could have like a really shallow answer. Like it would be like, oh, like I. It would be interesting to experience independent cinema in the 90s as an adult and be like oh there used to be like all of these huh. cool really movies. like cool chatty movies and they 
were released in all these theaters, and that might be kind of fun. But that's also a really shallow answer, and I am not watching that. That's a fair point. Back <laughs> in the day, in the 90s, because I grew up in the 90s, and I'm seeing all of the, you know, just like the big things, hitting the multiplexes that I saw with my friends and family. What was the first independent movie you saw in a very small, in a very small theater that kind of, you know, maybe changed the way you looked at cinema as a young person? Uh, where I grew up in Florida didn't have any independent cinemas. So my first independent cinema was actually in college. And the one that I remember most strongly, and unfortunately it's not like a cool little movie, it's There Will Be Blood. Uh, oh, I remember shit. seeing There Will Be Blood in cinemas. That's that always was pretty a good spectacular. answer to any question. <laughs> yeah, but it was only like 15 years ago. We're not talking about like, you know, the golden era of, of uh, indie cinema. We're talking about like Oscars that we still remember. <laughs> Anything come to mind? Uh, when I was in high school, I saw SLC Punk at the Hillcrest Cinemas in San Diego. And I th that, that was really a key experience in just getting interested in film. And then I saw Space Odyssey 2001 in a re-release at the Ken Cinema, which is the same, which are both landmark now, but both small San Diego independent theaters. Yeah. That's, that's another thing that I think we need more of, re-releases like that. Yeah. Um, I just, I'm sorry, I have to revise my answer because I realized oh, it was please. dishonest. There was one called the Tampa Theater, um, and I saw a double feature of uh, Ryan Johnson's Brick and Casablanca Whoa. for the first time ever. That's, That's so sick. That was awesome. <laughs> that, and that was that transformative. Makes me jealous. I yes. feel so much better that there was an indie cinema somewhere yeah. there, but that was a great, great answer. Yeah. Um, one thing that I do actually remember from our last chat that I want to bring back up is. You, in particular, had a very positive outlook on the rise of streaming services mm -hmm. because I stress daily at this point that we are going to lose the big screen experience as we get more streaming services out there. So I'm just curious, from November of last year to now, especially with Disney Plus on the horizon, has that changed your stance on that at all? And especially while you're trying to get distribution for a movie like this. No, it hasn't really changed my stance. The, the, the positive outlook had, had some nuance, which is, as an independent filmmaker, it's just really hard to get a movie made. And streamers are starting to just throw money at independent filmmakers to make the weirdest stuff. And we didn't, there was that, they're filling a gap that didn't exist before. Now also, you know, the big caveat is we don't know what Disney's gonna do, which it could be wonderful. And it could be that all we ever get to watch is one kind of movie and because they have, you know, they're a steamroller. We'll find out. Um, but the fact is, is Netflix hasn't really slowed down on green lighting weird stuff that, you know, and um, the theatrical experience, you are correct, is becoming something uh, closer to vinyl. But also we've, we've heard that, uh, that there's actually been kind of a resurgence. And weirdly mm -hmm. enough, in some ways, thanks to the box office returns from Disney movies, which is an odd way to feel, right? Um, okay. So uh, the other thing that's a, that, that we were talking about then was uh, movie pass was yes. a big oh, part I of it movie pass. because but now it's subscription services to very large movie chains mm -hmm. nobody's fault like that's what movie pass gave us mm -hmm. was a response you know a, a market response to all you can eat cinema um and for me that's just wonderful because if uh if you if people are worried about spending $17 on a ticket to go see an independent film and they'd just be like I don't know I, I just need to see a really big film for that kind of money I understand that mindset I don't mm -hmm. feel it but I get it um, if there's a subscription service that solves that problem but if it's only at the really big chains that only play really big movies we got a problem back so it's just a give and take that keeps on going back and forth month by month I feel like every single time a piece of news breaks that stresses me out about the future of cinema, I need to just like ask your opinion because you have a very positive, <laughs> sunny outlook on it, and it makes me feel a lot better. Well, the, the other thing too is, is that with all of these streaming uh, options, they have to create content for all of these, and the TV that's being created as content is better than it's ever been. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like true. the Leftovers seasons two and three was some of the best cinema of my life. Uh, just isn't on a big screen. That's all. Do you guys think about moving over to the series format at all? all like in time, particular, I actually feel like this scenario could suit that because I <clears throat> do wonder, like does Synchronic exist beyond this contained story that we got? We, we agree with you, TV executives. We agree. <laughs> one, one, one thing we've talked about with Synchronic that'd be really interesting is exploring uh, the, the manufacturers of designer synthetic drugs. Because it's such a bizarre, weird, crazy business. Because it's like, 
you're recklessly making these molecules that are just barely legal, rushing them out into the marketplace, and like having like getting your buddy to graphic yeah. design the package it looks ridiculous you're testing them on yourself and your <laughs> friends yes. or not at all like that's the option <laughs> there's no medical and, research on them and, you know there's going out to like a handful of gas stations and and, and head shops are sold online uh that is uh, and like the, the thought process of being like we have to make packaging that stands out on a shelf with bath salts, K1, and spice, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, some, some DJ with frosted tips that like knows Photoshop is, <laughs> is gonna like get in and make your synchronic package. How did uh, the, the part about um, Anthony Mackie's condition come into the story too? Did, they, did that and synchronic and what it is go hand in hand or did you need a way for synchronic to make sense to work for him? A lot of the time, um, people feel like the doors of perception are, are is via the pineal gland. It's it's unproven. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of in mysticism, but it's interesting. Everybody kind of knows it. It's located where the third eye is and all of that. And so we thought, okay, if this is a film that is affecting perception, I'm sorry, if this is a drug that is affecting yeah. perception um, and also deals with these cosmic uh, issues of death, let's, let's use that as a mechanism. So him having cancer on his pineal gland mm -hmm. that seems to affect his method of perception was, was an, I mean, it took a while to get there, but it was a natural progression once you realize it. Because uh, also we have a paramedic who deals with death on the reg and now has to look at his own premature death in the same way. And when you came up with the story, was it always set in Louisiana? Because when you talk about all that kind of stuff, I mean, third eye, it just seems like it fits the, like, the New Orleans vibe very mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. So was it always the plan to set the story there yeah yeah it was it was always new orleans uh you know there's so many cultural layers in new orleans there's a lot of really interesting spirituality in new orleans so even though there's literally no connection between you know synchronic and new orleans voodoo for example uh there's something interesting about that vibe and just mm -hmm. putting it in that world yeah. Absolutely. I'm going to say congratulations, and I'm going to say goodbye to everybody who hasn't seen Synchronic. But if you want to hear more about this movie, we're going to have a brief spoiler video coming your way when the movie is released. Thank you guys so much for watching this. Do not leave this video without liking and sharing it, and we'll be back soon with more tip coverage.